Well, let's look at 1 John chapter 2 tonight. Uh, we've opened up the book of 1 John, and John just has, some, I believe, some amazing truths for us. He talks in chapter 1 about the joy that we can have and it can be full when we walk with Jesus Christ. And I hope that you have a vibrant, joy-filled life as you walk with Jesus Christ. If you don't, check your walk with Christ, all right, because he wants to have fellowship with you every single day. John goes on, he says, listen, you can trust me because we saw it, we heard it, and I handled the word of life. I touched Jesus Christ himself. I touched him myself. He said, I'm a credible, I'm a credible witness. Chapter 2, we looked at a few weeks ago about how, how he says, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. Jesus Christ brings freedom and victory in our life. All right, he brings victory from sin and victory from the problems that plague us. And then he goes on to, to let us know that if and when we mess up, we have an advocate. We have someone who argues for us, and his name is Jesus Christ the righteous. We pick up here, and, and John kind of takes a strange turn in the next few verses, beginning in verse number 7. He takes a turn that, that doesn't really, at first glance, make sense with where he's going. I've titled the message, Are You Serious? Because as John presents this next concept, uh, he's talked about fellowship with God. He's talked about walking with God and what that looks like. And he brings, in, he brings in this other concept that at first glance, and some words that he uses, some words and phrases, are at first glance, I think, or I thought when I was studying, a little bit confusing. But as I opened and studied God's word, the Lord showed me some things that, man, just warmed my heart up. The title of the message is, Are You Serious? First John chapter 2, let's read verse 7 through 11, where John says, Brethren... Now, I'm going to point out this again because he's writing to Christians and there's a very specific context and application for this. All right, and he didn't want us to miss the fact he's talking again to fellow Christians. All right, so don't miss that. He's talking to Christians. So just in case you think this is for somebody else, it's not. If you're saved, he's talking to you, he's talking to me. All right, and it makes sense we're going with, with the context of this passage. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you. But an old commandment which ye had from the beginning, the old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. So he says, listen, I'm not writing a new commandment, but an old commandment, an old commandment which ye have heard from the beginning. Then verse number eight, again, a new commandment I write unto you. Now Paul's right there. He just said in verse number seven, I'm not writing a new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, commandment. Verse number eight, but I write to you a new commandment. We're like, John, are you trying to blow my mind? What are you trying to say here? All right, what, what, what are you trying to teach us right here, John? It's old, it's new, I can't figure it out. I was thinking about this and thinking about the context of buying a car. We're kind of in that context right now. And it used to be new cars and used cars, right? It's not anymore, is it? New, certified, pre-owned, previously used, used to be nice, could have been nice, almost cheap. I mean, there's like a thousand different titles where it's new or used. So John, we're hoping to clarify this, but John says, no, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Remember, that light refers to Jesus Christ and light that he brings. I am the light of the world. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Lord, I thank you for this passage, for this time. Lord, I thank you for this church and what you've done here. Lord, I pray that you wouldn't stop working here at First Baptist Church. Lord, you'd work in my heart, even tonight. Lord, work in the hearts of those who are listening. Lord, would you take your word and would you accomplish what you want to accomplish tonight through it? Lord, I pray for this concept specifically about how we love one another. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be challenged, to be honest before you. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. John argues that a, there will always be an outward manifestation of an inward transformation. There will be an outward manifestation of an inward transformation. He began that argument in chapter number one in some very specific ways about how he said, if you say this and do this, you're lying. If you say this and, and think this, then you're deceived. And if you say this and do this and deny this, then God's a liar. You're calling God a liar. 
He continues with this concept that there will always be an outward manifestation of an inward transformation, and now he applies it to this concept, love for your brother. Now, do you remember the very first word he opened to this particular section with? What was it? Look there. Say it again with me. Look at it. Brethren, talking to Christians. So when he introduces the word brother to us, he's not talking about our flesh and the blood, all right, our blood relatives. It could include them, but he's talking about our spiritual family. Look around this place. Do it. Look around. This is your spiritual family, right? It's not confined to this room. There are other Christians, other spiritual family, but this is a real representation of your spiritual family. You're hitched to this family, like you're hitched to me, right? There's some funny family, funny looking family. There's some smart family, not so smart family. Family that makes mistakes, yes. You ever been hurt by family? Yeah. You ever been hurt by somebody at church? Yeah. You have. Hey, it was years ago now, and it, we laugh about it now, but years ago my wife was here, and, and she was bugging me and, and kind of saying, she goes, honey, honey, do I look overweight to you? I better take a drink. <laughs> I'm telling her, no, honey, no, 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 honey, you're, you're a very slender lady, there's no way. We're on the bus, and, and a little girl puts her hand on, on my wife's belly and says, are you pregnant? This is years ago, and she wasn't. And um, <clears throat> she said, she said, Jay, are you lying to me? Okay. Are, you know, or something like that. And listen, that's, that's a question like, oh, wives, you can't ask your husband, okay? I'm not, there's, a, there's a no win answer on that. And we came here, came here to church, and, and um, someone here asked, asked my wife, she goes, he goes uh, this particular individual said, are, are, you, are you pregnant? And she goes, you know, you're like the second or third person to ask me that today. It must be this dress. No, I'm not. And they responded with, Oh, just fat then. <laughs> right, honey? <I> mean, I... <laughs> um, it's probably a few things you shouldn't say at church. <laughs> to anybody? Show us a lady. Now, my wife was not offended. I mean, she, she said, that's it. You know, that's it. You know, no more donuts for me. And uh, my wife's not, not, a, not a large lady. Of course, you know this. But come to this concept, we talk about love for the brother. And I could give you story after story of times that people have been hurt by Christians. Times that there have been spats and arguments among Christians, and John is attacking a relational aspect of our walk with Christ, and the aspect is not toward Christ, it's toward other people. And he says, you have to love the family. And you're supposed to love the family. And he goes beyond that and says, if you truly love God, you'll love the family. Do me a favor, turn the person next to you and say, I love you. Oh, that's so special. Now, if only, if only it were that easy. If only that's all it took. If only it was just a, hey, I look to you. And, but, but he goes deeper, and, and as I kind of paint the background for this, in the book of 1 John, this is only the first time he'll open up this concept. In uh, chapter 2, verse 7 through 11, in chapter 3, um, he'll talk about how our salvation will be manifested, verse number 10, about this love toward our brother. In chapter 3, verses 15 through 18, he'll talk about it again. He'll talk about this when we get to that section, how it's more than just words. There's an outward thing about this. In chapter 4, he'll compare again about loving our brother and how, how he'll say it comes from God himself. In verse number 12 of chapter 4, he'll talk about when I love one another, God's love, God's love is perfected in my life. In verse 20 of chapter 4, that if you can't love your brother who you can see, then you can't really love God who you can't see. And in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, he says, we'll love people as we love God. And so uh, seven different passages in, in 1 John, John brings this idea up of loving your brother, your Christian family. This is not an isolated thought for him. It's a reoccurring theme throughout the book of 1 John. This is just the first time that we've been introduced to it in, in, in our series. And so John says, listen, you're, you're going to walk with God, then you're going to love the family of God your brother. You say, well, Brother Howell, I love the people here. That's why I come. We're going to open that up tonight and see what he really means by that. 
Is it just saying I love you? Is it just shaking someone's hand? You see, there should be an outward manifestation of an inward transformation. An inward walk with Christ is revealed with an outward walk with other Christians. An inward fellowship with God is always supposed to be shown by outward relationship with God's children. He goes on to make some pretty stout statements. I want to look first of all, though, at the, at the old command. In verse 7, John says this, he goes, I write no new commandment unto you, but an, of an old commandment. I begin to study this and try to figure out what is John trying to say here. All right, is it an old commandment? Is it a new commandment? And the answer is yes. Yes. You see, there is, a, there is an old commandment on there. Now, I believe partly in John was, I, as I understand this correctly from 1 John, he was dealing with some people who were trying to reject the law from the Old Testament. Apparently, John, in some aspect, was dealing with the people that said, you know what, Christ came so the law doesn't matter at all, and he's bringing us back to what God told us in the Old Testament. The fact is we have the same phenomenon going outward right now in 2019, where people say, listen, it's just about God's grace. It doesn't matter about anything else, and God's grace surpasses everything. And God's grace is wonderful. It is why we are here, because of grace. Brother Brady sang that song this morning, Were It Not For Grace. Absolutely. But that does not completely eradicate and erase the entire rest of the Bible. So John says there is an old commandment here that you have to remember, know about. It's almost like someone said, surely, John, you're not speaking about the law. Surely you don't expect me to actually do anything now that I'm saved. I mentioned this before, but I was talking to someone once, and they said, well, you know, the Holy Spirit, by God's grace, just leads me to do certain things, like leads me to stay home on a Wednesday night. I'm sorry, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's not His grace. That's what we call your flesh. All right? Uh, staying home from church is not from the Lord. Unless you have Ebola. Then it's from God Himself. And surely, John, there are no, any, surely there aren't any expectations on me now. And, and that's what they're trying to defeat in this grace view where they say, listen, God doesn't expect anything. It's all by him. But as I read my Bible, Jesus has some expectations on his disciples. He gives us the power through his grace to do them. But he says, listen, if you follow me, you're going to keep my commandments. Those are the words of Jesus himself. And John says, there is an old commandment. And so I begin to search, well, what was that old commandment? You know, I could not find in the Old Testament a commandment that said, love your brother. Couldn't find it. I didn't find one that, that says, uh, if you hate your brother, you're not in the light, you're in darkness. It's not in the Old Testament. So I'm like, John, what are you talking about? Then I found this passage in Matthew. And if you hold your, hold your finger in 1 John chapter 2 and turn to Matthew chapter 22, if you would, please. One thing you'll find with me, I think, uh, and it's something that I try to strive for, is that uh, Peter says that no scripture is of any private interpretation. That means that no scripture stands alone. It is always found in context of other scripture. And I love when scripture illuminates scripture. When I can look at this and see what God says over here and how it just lo locks in perfectly. In Matthew chapter 22, if you have a, the Bible that has a red type, you'll see this is red because Jesus is saying this. And Jesus said unto him, verse 37 of Matthew chapter 22, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second, here it is, is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. Go back to 1 John, if you would, please. As I understand what Jesus is saying, he said, listen, the first thing that I was trying to, the first point I was trying to get across to you in all my commandments is that I want you to love me with your heart, your soul, and your mind. I want you to love me completely. And if you missed that, you've missed the point of what God was teaching us in the Old Testament. That's what Jesus said. But he said the second commandment is like, is like unto it. And he says, the second commandment is, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Or love my neighbor as I want to be loved. Hey, we'll call it the golden rule, do unto others as you would want them to do unto yourself. 
But what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22 is this. Don't miss the point. Jesus said, don't, don't miss the point of what hangs in the law and the prophets. Love God and love others. Love God and love others. A recurring theme throughout the entire Bible. From the first page to the last page, love God with everything you've got and love other people. And if you don't love God and you don't love other people, then you're not obeying God. And so John is saying, there is an old message. Don't mistake the message, an old commandment. You're supposed to love other people. But there's a new aspect to it. You see, in the old, in the old commandment, the love other people is like, well, by loving them, I won't be covetous about them. I won't, I won't lie about them. I won't steal from them. There will be some outward things. And Jesus now raises the expectation. There's a new expectation. You see, it is the old commandment to love other people. Jesus said that. But there's a new commandment, a new expectation, a higher expectation. Jesus continually throughout the New Testament when he was teaching raised the bar, did he not? He said, it has been said you do this, but I expect you to do this over here. You thought this was okay. I want you to do this. You did this and that was good, but you missed my point over here. You tithed of your, of your herbs, basically, but you missed the bigger issues of mercy and grace and truth. And Jesus continually throughout the New Testament has raised the bar. He's raised the expectation. And so when John comes to us and he says, listen, I write a, not a new commandment, it's an old commandment, we ought to know that the Bible teaches from the first page to the last page to love God and to love other people. That should not be brand new news to us. It's an old commandment. But the new commandment is this, that now Jesus has raised the expectation. You see, Jesus said this. You'll know, you probably won't know this verse, but in John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you. Jesus said a new commandment. That ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. You may not know verse 34, that passage that I just read, but you'll probably know verse 35, the very next verse, where he says, Jesus says, by this, shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Help me, if you know it, if ye have love one to another. You might not have realized that Jesus said in verse 34 of that passage, John chapter 13, I'm going to give you a new commandment, which is what John is quoting again in 1 John. You probably have heard that new expectation where Jesus said the mark that the whole world by this shall all men, by, the, by this mark everyone will know that you're my disciple, not how short your hair is or how long your dress is or what version of the Bible you use, and those are all good things. They're not bad. I'm not preaching against that. But that's not what Jesus said was the mark. Jesus did not say the mark was meeting Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. Jesus said the mark by which everyone will know that you are my disciple, disciple of Jesus Christ, is love one to another. And he was talking to the disciples. We see that clearly. And he said when you have the correct kind of love, we're going to talk about this in just a minute, then everyone will know that you are my disciple that you're not a fake, that you're not a phony, that you're not just putting on an act, that you're not just showing up here Sunday morning and pretending to be a Christian. They, they will know that you're a true Christian. This will be the banner that you will wave. Love one to another. That's why John says, this is a new commandment. The old one was love thy neighbor as yourself, but the new commandment, is to love your brother. He does not fully flush it out right here. He will by the rest of the book. Jesus gives us this concept. Paul says this in Ephesians, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. And have given himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. You say, that's great, Brother Howell. Well, let me get down now where it sits. Because that's the foundation for now, what I call the application. I don't think you could look through Scripture and argue with what I'm presenting to you right now. I don't think you can argue with the two commandments because that's what Jesus said himself. You can't argue with the new commandment because that's what Jesus also said. You can't argue that love is a mark of a Christian. That's what Jesus and the Bible say. But when I look at what Jesus said and then what Paul said, 
And I see that the inward expectations have been raised and the outward expectations. It's something that Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 that I just read that caught me, where he says this, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. It should be no surprise to us as Christians that when the Bible comes to us and, and now tells us how to love, it gives us an example to follow, and his name is Jesus Christ. So now I am supposed to judge my love toward my fellow Christians, the people that sit at, around me at church, the people I may meet out who are Christians out and about another state, all right, another school who plays sports against, who are still Christians. We can get so fed up, oh, that, that church, that school, that they beat us in soccer and they beat us in volleyball. No, no, those are Christians. They're my brothers and sisters, and I'm supposed to be marked by love for them. There are two other tremendous churches in this area. I think of Sheridan Road and Community Baptist of Saginaw. There's some other good churches as well, but, but those two are very close to us. You could walk into either one of those churches on, on a Sunday evening, and they'd be having church, of course, and, and you could sit through that service, and you would know almost exactly what was happening. When they sang a song, you would know probably the exact song that they sang. When they opened the Bible, you'd, you'd know even how the service was orchestrated. And yet sometimes we get so bent out of shape by the people here at church and other churches, and that's who Jesus says you're supposed to love the most. And the comparison is how Jesus Christ himself loves. You see, the inward expectations have been raised. I will not love you like myself. The old commandment was, love thy neighbor as thyself. But now I will love you like Jesus Christ loves you. You see, if I love you like myself, then I'll give you the bigger piece of cake because I'd like the bigger piece of cake, and that's a nice thing. And we ought to be caring in, with each other. And, and if we love you like myself, then, then I think, well, well, what would I like? And I'll get that for them. But can you see how when I now make Jesus the comparison, how high the bar is raised? It's not just what I would like, it's what would Jesus do? How would he love? And the Bible says this like this, rejoice with those that rejoice. Someone gets something nice. And our first thought is, I wish that was me. I wish that was my blessing. I wish I got that. It must be nice. What a terrible phrase. What a terrible phrase to think that somehow every blessing that you ever get from everybody I know, I ought to get myself. But that's what we're saying. I wish I'd gotten that new car. I wish I'd gotten that house. I wish I'd, I'd gotten that promotion. I wish I'd gotten that bonus. I wish I'd gotten that blessing. And, and if God, you know, wow, he just kind of missed me. And, and, and we always pick all these blessings from all these other people, and we're so selfish. Because that's not how Jesus Christ loves us. The inward expectation has been raised. But so have the outward expectations. See, when I begin to love like Jesus loves, and I begin to exhibit the patience that Jesus exhibits. Patience founded in a love, self-sacrificing love. Do you have patience toward your fellow Christians? Well, they walked past me down the hallway. They didn't even say hello to me. Great. You say hello to them? Well, they should have said hello to me first. You've been out of shape about that. No patience. Look, we're all flesh and blood in this room. There are going to be times that we're going to offend somebody else in this church building. Just show them the patience, not that you want to be shown. That's the old commandment. The new commandment, show them the patience that Jesus Christ shows you you. How many times have you asked for forgiveness for the same thing? Help for the same thing? What if Jesus forgave like we forgave? And you come forward, you're like, God, please forgive me, you know, for my anger. And, and God announces in front of all of us, nope, not this time. Wouldn't that be embarrassing? Nope, I don't think you mean it. I don't think you're serious. But I read it because John just said a few verses back, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, outward expectations have been raised in forgiveness. How about in sacrifice? I 
buggy about sitting in different seats, and we're great about that at this church. As far as if someone sat in your seat, you tend to move. I remember a story Pastor Lett told once about how, I think it was him, uh, that, that he was with somebody and they had made the speaker move. It wasn't him, it was another speaker he was with. I don't think that ever happened to First Baptist Church. I hope it wouldn't happen here. But you, you ever sacrifice for your fellow Christians? How about the nursery? It's a place to sacrifice. We have a nursery so that we can worship in here without having to change diapers during the service. And I'm thankful for that. People who sacrifice on the buses week in and week out, you ever pray for them? Thank them for what they do? You see, the, the expectation is raised to sacrifice. How about when you have a problem? How about we start to solve them correctly? Not on Facebook, not on a group of people, but the way the Bible asks us to solve problems. Because I love them like Jesus loves me. How does Jesus solve a problem? Well, one way I see in Revelation when he says, I stand at the door and knock, they may hear my voice and open the door. It's one way. He comes in. Paul says in Galatians, uh, um, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. You see, I begin to love other Christians like Jesus loved me, and I realize how far short we fall. How about praying? You pray for your fellow Christians? You say you love them. You come to church and shake their hand. Man, it's great to see you. How are you doing? But when you walk out of these doors and tomorrow morning, you ever pray for anybody else in this room? Pray for the people that you sat next to for the last 15 years in the same pew or within three pews of yourself? You know every hair they have on their head? You know how they're, as they're turning gray because you watched it turn gray as you sat behind them? You know them that well? You ever pray for them? Man, they're losing it. I can see they're, I can see they're getting bald now. You ever pray for them? They didn't see so-and-so. You pray for them? See, we claim to love our fellow, our fellow Christians, but I wonder if truly we just fall short. Because John said, if you truly walk in the light, you will love your brother. You won't claim to hate them. You won't be deceived about it. And verse number 10 says, there'll be none occasion of stumbling in him. See, John says, as you love your fellow Christian the way you ought to, you remove hindrances. Impediments is the word there, some impediments. In Michigan, I'd call them potholes in your life. It's great for Michigan. You've been driving down the road and you hit that pothole that you didn't see coming. Wham! You think that I popped my tire. Oh my goodness! And John says if you love your brother correctly, there's no occasion of stumbling in him. Seems kind of odd, doesn't it? That, that in one sense, my path becomes smoother the more I love my brother. I didn't make it up. That's what John says. He says, if you don't, though, then you're really just walking in darkness. You're lost in darkness, and you're blinded by darkness. I remember someone once who was quite bitter about at a fellow Christian. Remember because when I, this conversation came up, they became quite exercised about this fellow Christian and the hurt they'd experienced. And no doubt the hurt was real. I'm not downplaying the hurt. But in the context of this verse, as they were spitting their bitterness, their hatred, they were exercised about this situation, they were truly blinded by darkness. You could ask them, doesn't God want you to forgive? Yeah, but you don't know, and all they could see was the darkness. Doesn't God want you to get past this? But you don't, and all they could see was darkness. See, John says you love one another. When you do that, you mimic Jesus Christ. Not only do you mimic him, you show outwardly what happens here. And your path will be free from stumbling, impediments. If not, you'll be blinded. Do you love your brother? Not like yourself. 
That's the old way. The new way, like Jesus Christ himself. That's what John raises the bar to. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for your love for me, your patience, your forgiveness, Lord, even your prayer that you prayed for me. Lord, I'd ask that you'd help us to be honest, to search our hearts. Just a minute, we'll stand to our feet and the piano will play. Simple question, do you love your brother? Maybe not the way you thought you should when you came in. In light of what John says, do you love your brother? That's the mark. That's the banner. That's the flag that Jesus said everyone will know us by. Lord, bless his invitation time. May we love you, or love you and love our brother the way we ought to in Jesus' name.